Thanks so much. Good morning, everybody. So thanks um, for the kind invitation, for all the effort and sweat to Umoj and Matt for setting up this uh, wonderful uh, workshop. So with the next 45 minutes or so, we shall be concerned with correlations, area laws, and stability of open and thermal quantum many-body systems. This being joint work with a number of people, specifically with Michael, who is also here. This is admittedly a very long title, but the point of the talk is rather short, namely that in a way that there's more to Hamiltonian complexity, complexity than to look at ground states of local Hamiltonians and that it can also be interesting to look at thermal states of open and Lovillian systems. So these here are the credo questions of this um, workshop, like whether ground states of natural quantum systems can succinctly be described. If you heard about the local Hamiltonian problem being QMA complete and um, steps about steps towards the holy grail of the quantum PCP theorem in Matt's um, and Dorit's talk. So in this talk we shall be less concerned with the first bullet point on this list but rather with the second asking whether this exponential complexity of general quantum systems in a way persists at high temperature. So after all how about thermal and Lovillian open uh, many body systems. Anyway the type of question we have in mind is pretty much similar to the usual question when, questions when asked in the ground state context. Say, for example, concerning the, the short-rangedness and clustering of correlations in ground states. Say, uh, we know that if you have a many-body system which has a uniform gap above the ground state energy, then all correlation functions would decay exponentially with the distance in the lattice, as has first been shown by, by Matt um, using uh, Lee Robinson bounds. Now this kind of short-rangedness of correlations can, as we know, be sharpened and made more precise by um, notions of area laws for the entanglement entropy. So this locality is inherited by the locality of interactions. And this is proven to hold true for gapped one-dimensional systems, again proven by Matt using Lee Robinson bounds, um, also like for free, quasi-free bosonic and fermionic many-body systems in arbitrary dimensions as we have shown and it may or may not be true for arbitrary um, gap models in, in, in any dimension. Um, we also know that this notion of an area law is very much intertwined with the question of how difficult it is to approximate many-body states with tensor network states, say with matrix product states in one-dimensional systems and there's this beautiful polynomial time algorithm for approximating ground states of one-dimensional gap local Hamiltonians again by uh, people in, in, in the audience here. So this is kind of the, the flavor, the type of question we have in mind throughout the talk, yet applied to the world not of ground states but to thermal and <coughs> open uh, many-body systems. That's kind of the mindset of, uh, of this talk. Okay, so specifically why is the latter um, Interesting. So at the beginning of all this is the question of what happens if you not only have local <laughs> many-body interactions, Hamiltonian interactions in the lattice, but on top of that the system is subject to kind of dissipation from the outside. Obviously such a situation is ubiquitous in physics in a way every quantum system is an open system to some extent, but this seems specific specifically interesting in the context of uh, precisely engineered dissipation, so in a, in a situation where one has a system in the lab, sitting there in the lab under precisely controlled conditions and where one can in a, in a way engineer the dissipation, it can kind of make use of that and, and has a knob to play and, and, and turn with in, in one way or, or the other. Um, so this is a, here's a bit of a physics motivation of this, why this is so much studied in the specifically in the physics um, literature. You can think, say, of systems of cold atoms in optical lattices which are made from counter-propagating laser light where you really have a controlled many-body systems in the lab also undergoing uh, dissipation. There's a cold atoms component to this. One can think of a um, quantum optics component where people really think of engineering, precisely engineering the, the noise that you have to a given uh, a figure of merit. And there's a many-body component to this, which is, of course, in the, in, in the focus um, in, in the focus of this talk. So why, is, why are these kind of dissipative, open, many-body systems so much studied uh, uh, these days? And why are people so excited about it? 
But to start with, of course, there's this, the basic question of um, just looking at the interplay of Hamiltonian many body interactions and dissipative like open systems uh, dynamics in one way or the other. So one, one can think of like dissipative quantum phase transitions. One can think of notions of noise driven criticality or ideas of topological order, but not of ground states, but of stationary states of many body uh, um, systems. One can even think of dissipative quantum computing. This is quite an appealing picture of quantum computing where it has a many body system given. One just lets it cool down in time and reads out one qubit at the end of the day. And this is a BQP machine, this is a universal quantum computer and quite a, an appealing way of thinking of quantum computing where it's not, there's no control but you just have one fixed Lovillian sitting there and the system cools down and, and that gives rise to, to a universal um, quantum computing. And um, one can even dream of like passive dissipative topologically protected quantum memories in low dimension and I will um, comment on, on this also uh, later um, in, in, in this talk. This is kind of the, the mindset of this open systems um, Lovellian setting. So the role of the Hamiltonian gap in this ground state world is largely taken over by the Lovellian gap in the Lovellian open systems world and one can even think of in a way of notions of Lovellian complexity reminding of notions of Hamiltonian complexity and then kind of find the where well, I can largely translate yes maybe we'll get to this later but is there any way to make a formal connection between Hamiltonian and Lovellian gap uh, well, we, yes and no we get to this later okay yeah thank you uh, so will you, will you tell us what the Lovellian yes I will yeah, yes. So, um, I guess the special case of the Lovellian is in Hamiltonian, right? So, is there, um, is there like uh, um, an amount of dissipation that you want to be above to, to make things interesting? Or? Um, oh, these are all interesting questions. Can I kind of just postpone them a little bit? Okay. When I have the definition of a Lovellian and so? Yeah, um, yeah indeed. Um, okay, so one can ask lots of questions. Um, what is already happening? Uh, um, so, for example, um, how is the like how is like how is what's the connection between like uh, mixing in time and mixing in space in a way? So one can think of questions of how the closing of the Liouville gap is related to a clustering of correlations. One can think of area laws in dissipative systems, notions of stability, uh, topological dissipative memories, and if time allows, well, let's see how it goes. We will address these questions. Um, in, the, in this talk. And then in the second part of the talk we will come back to the original question of this complexity of, of thermal high temperature states and will ask questions, well the more physics question whether temperature is intensive or local, again about correlations and clustering of correlations in thermal many body systems and um, about the computational complexity of computing expectation values building upon, well shockingly work by Matt, what can I say. Um, Okay, so correlations in open many body systems. Okay, so here's the Lovellian. So the setting we are in is the Lovellian setting, uh, reflecting memoryless Markovian open systems dynamics. And this is often to an overwhelmingly good approximation, uh, an approximation of the true open system many body dynamics, which means that the equation of motion of the system is replaced by such a an equation of motion here where the right hand side is called the, the Lovellian, which is the generator of the dynamical semi-group. Um, so this is still effective system dynamics. One does not is explicitly speak of the environment. This is kind of inbuilt in the right hand side where these LKs are the so-called Lindblad operators that reflect the open system dynamics and define what's going on um, in, the, in, 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 the, in the open system dynamics. So in a similar way as Hamiltonian terms, which are natural many body systems are usually local, spatially local on a, on a graph. One usually thinks of these Lindblad operators being geometrically local on some, some graph. So you would have like on-site noise or nearest neighbor noise or so, but not everybody being coupled to everybody. And again, like Hamiltonian terms are usually bounded, but would have a uniform operator norm upper bound to all, each of these Lovellian terms just to keep the the coupling strength in a way bounded in, in the problem. Now the 
role of the ground state is largely taken over by the stationary state of such a Levillian, that's well, it's just the stationary state that's often taken to be of full rank. Then the Levillian is called a so called primitive Levillian and um, satisfying detailed balance. That's a rather natural condition. Um, say, uh, like uh, uh, Davies maps that have the Gibbs states as the stationary state would satisfy um, that, that condition. Now, that's the stationary state. So if one waits for long enough, any state would be just driven to the stationary uh, state. In, in, in time. And this notion of being kind of driven to the stationary state can be made more precise by laying a statement of that type that if you look for any primitive local levillian at the distance of the time evolved state in time, so L is the levillian, the, the generator of the dynamical semigroup, if you look at the trace norm distance to the stationary state, that would be upper bounded by the right hand side here, where there's a prefactor and an exponential factor e to the power of minus. Uh, uh, gamma t, where lambda is the Lovillian gap that's related to the largest real part of the eigenvalue of this Lovillian, to, to come back to this, this question, that in a way resembles the Hamiltonian gap in closed systems. So the, the mixing time, so the time you need to be trace norm epsilon close to the stationary state would be governed by this, this right hand side, so the, by the prefactor and the Lovillian gap in the, in, in, in the, in the system. Okay, um, good. So, you. So yeah. It is really the gap in the spectrum. Yeah. It's the gap in the spectrum, but of the, the gap in the spectrum of the Levillian. That's just the generalization of, if you think of a continuous Markov chain, it would be gap of the, of the Markov chain. Here is really the, spe the gap of the, of the Levillian. You're absolutely right. Yeah? So, you have a many way system. We wait, and it's driven to the stationary state. And we ask the question how, like, the the temporal mixing <coughs> is related to the spatial mixing. One could think that if it's kind of rapidly mixing in a way, in one way or the other, that kind of correlations might be short-ranged in the lattice in a certain way. And this can be most naturally be captured in the covariance, which is, well, you have seen this a million times. So that's just the largest uh, correlation function for any region A and B in the graph of any observable that has operator norm norm one, this is the largest correlation function that you can have. That is obviously related to other standard correlation measures like the trace distance or the mutual information correlation measure that can be bounded uh, by each other, of course, with a dimension dependent uh, prefactor in a way, like with the pin scale inequality. So yes. The question is always clear that there's no, uh, that's no space that's invariant. Uh, so, so it's just a one particular state. Oh, yeah, well, no, this is not, I mean, we look at, at unique full rank stationary states, um, but this is not necessarily the case, right? I mean, this can also be non-unique, indeed, you're absolutely right. But kind of the, the Levillians we look at are um, like primitive Levillians with a unique full rank um, state. This is a rather natural setting. Like if, think of like a, like a Davies map, I just have a system that's driving to a thermal state, to Gibbs state of a many body hematoid. That's the, the type of mindset that, that you have in mind here. So, um, uh, so again, the so gap Hamiltonians of uh, away from phase transitions show clustering of correlations. Here you have that um, correlations far away in the lattice would be exponentially decaying with the distance in the lattice. So how about gap Lovillians? Is the, the kind of temporal mixing inherited by a kind of spatial mixing and a locality of interactions in, in, in the lattice? And this indeed turns out to be the case. Um, that's, a, that's the first result that indeed if you have A and B non-overlapping subsets and you look, consider a local bounded Lovillian with a stationary state sigma, a gap lambda and a Lee Robinson velocity V, I say something about this in a second, then indeed you would have that the, correlation, the correlations in the lattice would uh, decay exponentially with the distance in, in, in the lattice. So this kind of the, the, the mixing time that's related to the gap and the, the prefactor is related to this spatial uh, mixing in, in the lattice. And you get a decay of correlations reminding of the ground state features of a gapped Hamiltonian uh, problem. It's capital D is the Sorry? Capital D is the local dimension? Yes, that's the dimension. And I will say something about the, the Lee Brauer's velocity in, in, in a second when I, I kind of have a, a slide on how this is proven. It's actually rather simple. Um, 
It's just the, 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 the maximum real part of the eigenvalue of the Levillian. Yeah, indeed. Um, so how is that shown? It's rather simple. You make it a time-dependent problem. You go to the Heisenberg picture. So ft is the time-evolved observable with L star being the dual generator of the semigroup, the Heisenberg picture Lovillian. And then you chuck the covariance into a time-dependent part of ftgt and a part that is a difference of the time-evolved part um, and, 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 and the, and the non-time-evolved part. And for the first sec uh, part, you make use of Hurler's inequality and in, uh, like chi squared mixing time tools and a variational characterization of the gap, where you find that this is upper bounded by, by these operator norm terms and that exponentially decaying term, which is rather natural because it just means that you're driven to the stationary state and the differences are being exponentially quickly blurred away if you approach the, the stationary state. And the second part can be captured by means of a Lee Robinson bound. Well, these have been mentioned uh, a million times already. See, these are kind of upper bounds to group velocities in, um, in, in Hamiltonian systems. They're usually formulated as upper bounds to, 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 to bounds on, on operator norms of commutators of time evolved observables in the Heisenberg picture. So it means that if you locally excite a system, there would be a causal cone, and excitations outside the causal cone would be exponentially suppressed in the distance in, in, in the in the lattice. And here you formulate a dissipative Lee Robinson bound that's rather similar in spirit. Um, there's many ways of formulating dissipative Lee Robinson bounds. Uh, one way of formulating is like this, where you have an observable that is supported on A and B, and you look at the time evolved um, observable FG, jointly time evolved, and compare it with the Ft, Gt individually time evolved. And it, the, the intuition really is that if you have an observable sitting here and an observable sitting there, then uh, if the cones of these uh, uh, time evolved observables don't overlap, then they more or less factor in the lattice with this upper bound uh, given by this here. So if the observables are far away and if the cones don't overlap, then there would be, um, this would factor up to an exponentially small a correction in a similar way as for Lee Robinson bounds for a ground state uh, problem. And then you have a time dependent problem. You kind of tweak with the time to balance the different bounds um, to, to get for a suitable time just the, the bound that I um, just, uh, just gave. Um, good. So this is not the only uh, way one can think of mixing of <coughs> Lovillian many body systems. There's also um, tighter, more stringent ways of looking at uh, uh, mixing. There's a uh, stronger concept of mixing based on a, on a log Sokolov concept, which is a kind of gap like quantity. In fact, for a primitive Lovillian, again, for a, a, a one that has a, a full rank um, stationary state, um, it would even be bounded from above <coughs> by the Lovillian gap. And there's also a variational characterization of this log Sobolev um, constant that's related to hyperconductivity. There's a large uh, classical literature on that, but this can also be made, made quantum, and that gives rise to a much more stringent type of mixing in a Lovillian uh, many body uh, uh, system. Specifically, if you look at any primitive local Lovillian, you would find that if you time evolve the state and look at the trace distance to the stationary state, that would be bounded from above by such an expression with the, with the uh, log Sobolev constant in it in an exponential form, but with the, the logarithm of the previous uh, uh, prefactor. So if you have a finite log Sobolev constant, you would get a much tighter, much more stringent bound on uh, uh, mixing times than for a finite Lovillian gap. Specifically, uh, well, if you have for a finite log find a Lovillian gap, you would have an order n uh, convergence time, if n is the system size here, would get a, a log n system size bound on the, on the mixing time. That's a much tighter way of thinking of mixing in Lovillian uh, uh, many body uh, systems. And um, in this setting, you can prove um, a number of nice things. Specifically, you get a mixing not only in the covariance, but also in the mutual information between different parts. And you, well, you can prove a couple of, um, 
of, 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 of nice things. For example, a stability result for local uh, uh, Louisvillian. So you think of having a Louisvillian given with a finite log solver left constant independent of the system size. And like QB would be a, you hammer the system locally, it would be a perturbation that's just acting somewhere on the lattice, on, on a region B. And look at the stationary state on the, of the joint uh, Louisvillian. You find that if you make a local measurement, so if you look at the trace distance of the two stationary states of the perturbed and the unperturbed Louisvillian, that they would be very close to each other. They would be bounded from above in trace norm to a term that's exponentially decaying in the distance in, in the latter. So in other words, local perturbations perturb locally. That's, it's, it complements also a beautiful kind of brother paper by Toby Cubit, Lucia Michalakis and Perez Garcia in a way that um, you get a stability result that um, well, that, that if you locally perturb a Louisvillian, that would only change the stationary state um, a little bit. So that would be important uh, um, in, in, in this context of kind of uh, engineering dissipation in the sense that if the, the dissipation is a bit wrong, then your stationary state will also be a bit wrong. So there's kind of a stability in that sense, reminding of the stability results of frustration-free local Hamiltonians as uh, Spiros and, and Matt and so on have looked at also a bit. Yes, please. Why is why do you need log Sobel up here and not just gap? Ah, um, well, there's two answers to this. I mean, first of all, the proof needs it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, second, I strongly believe that you do need this type of mixing. I come to that in a second. Um, I think. I mean, there's these, these kind of ways of describing that is slightly different. I mean, we look at a finite log Sobolev constant. In the, in the original other paper that talked about uh, the dissipated version of local topological quantum order, in a later version, they only talk about global rapid mixing, which is of log Sobolev type. So there's strong evidence that you do need this type of mixing to get stability. And I comment on that later. Although I'm not, this is a bit of an open question, but there seems to be strong evidence that you do need this type of mixing. But I, I comment on that, yeah? You already answered my question, actually. Oh, okay, good, yeah. So, but you, you are, this is an important point. You're absolutely right, I mean, with this question. I, I, I agree, yeah. Um, okay, so in this more stringent type, you can prove all kinds of things. I'll give another example. Uh, say you get an area law for, of course, not for the entire entropy. That would be meaningless if you have a mixed state. But you get an area law for the mutual information of a subsystem, A, with respect to the, the complement of the lattice, so under conditions that are very similar to the ones on the previous slide, you would get that the mutual information is bounded from above by this quantity here, where you find the, the boundary area of the distinguished region, uh, where epsilon is an additive constant that it can be made arbitrarily small, and um, well, there's a logarithmic dependence on the system size here. Uh, that, that's a bit awkward, I'm not sure whether this is an artifact of the proof or whether this is really there. Uh, but other it's than that, the sorry? The because you looked at that, um, or to Toby Cubit looked we, at it. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, you can, you okay. can log, log of the original. Okay, good. Um, indeed, okay. The artifact of the proof. So this is shown using uh, properties of the conditional mutual information that um, you would get an area law for the mutual information. Uh, that reminds of the area law for the mutual information of thermal states. So it's kind of the dissipative variant of the, of the thermal state mutual information area law capturing correlations between the system and the, the complement of the, of, of the system. Um, so lesson, time mixing time, like temporal uh, mixing relates to spatial mixing. If the, the mixing is fast enough, that then you get a kind of decay of correlations. In, in, in a certain way. So the lesson is rapidly mixing system exhibit exponentially clustering correlations. In a way, the mixing in time related to the, to the Lavillian gap or the finite log Sobolev constant is related to mixing in space, so a decay of a short rangeness of correlations. Um, there's the Lavillian gap or the log Sobolev constant that reminds of a Hamiltonian gap. That role is largely taken over by, the, by these gaps in, in, a, in a certain way. And um, and you encounter 
this kind of like mix, fast mixing versus locality of, 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 of interactions. And that's kind of intuitive in that sense if you have quickly driven to the stationary state that correlations cannot sufficiently fast build up in time to, to make long range correlations. So that's kind of an intuitive picture of how the, the, the mixing in time relates to the mixing in space. That also is a kind of quantum version of this program of time mixing versus spatial mixing that's a rather complete program in, in the classical Markov chain. Uh, uh, Markov chain world. And I think Fernando has also generalized that and given a talk, I think two weeks about such settings um, here at the, at the program. One. Yeah, one with one Michael. Yes. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So there's two different regimes, the finite Lovillian gap world and the finite log Sobolev constant world with rather different implications, um, which is a true quantum feature that's absent classically, that's only there in the quantum world. And it's also absent in free fermionic systems where one can also kind of uh, uh, slaughter the entire problem in all generality where one only has this more stringent kind of log Sobolev type mixing and, and the other thing is, is, is absent. So this is kind of the, the lesson of the 26 minutes? Oh, that's good. The lesson of the first part of the talk um, of correlations in space versus in, in, in time. So let me end this first part of the talk with a bit of a, an open question or a crime story that's um, emerging here. Um, like one of the applications of this is to think of um, optimal dissipative encoders to do to think of quantum memories. One can think of optimal dissipative encoders preparing through dissipation, say, a toric code. And this has been looked at, for example, in a beautiful paper by Denges, Koenig, and Pastavsky, where they looked at the time to prepare a topologically ordered state to be of the order L for an L by L lattice. Well, that you need order L is clear from a Lee Robinson bound, but they also show that what order L time is enough to prepare the state. Yeah, this is a good this is good news. Um, that also relates to Aaron's question. The thing yet is that, huh? For stability, you need this uh, finite log Sobolev constant, which gives rise to a, a, a convergence speed of log L, not of L. Yeah, so you have this kind of awkward uh, tension between these concepts that either you have topological order, but, but you need an order L convergence time, like a finite Lovillian gap, but for the stability you seem to need this finite log Sobolev constant, which gives rise to a log L convergence speed. So you're kind of too quick, then not even every part of the lattice could have talked to every part in the lattice and you cannot even build up topological order in time. So this, there seems to be a bit of a tension between these concepts of uh, either having topological order or stability in the lattice, which uh, uh, seems to be an important uh, open question to be overcome to think of reconciling that and think of dissipative stable passive quantum memories in one way or the other, which would be a big uh, application of all this. Maybe full stability is too much to ask for. Maybe you could think of preparing a state and having stability only in a suitable subspace to reconcile these two pictures. Maybe, but that would be an important open question. I'm even a bit fast, 28. So I'll come to the second and last part of the talk. Unless there are urgent questions on this. Okay, correlations in thermal states, coming back to the original question of, um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the very beginning. Um, and there's many motivations for that. Um, I start with the more physics-y motivation of that, related to the concept of locality of temperature, asking at what length scales temperature is actually defined. And that's, that's a huge discussion in the physics literature, People have all kinds of small structures, like nano devices, they put a thermometer there and they ask questions of the type, at what length scales could you even meaningfully speak of a, of a temperature? So this is a bit blah blah. So a more um, stringent version of speaking of locality of temperature, how this is usually um, uh, set up or, or defined would be, say if you have a kind of lattice model and the constituents are not interacting at all, then if you make a local measurement, 
Yeah? And you would find expectation values at this local measurement that would be compatible with a certain Gibbs state of a certain temperature, then you would assign that temperature to that given state. Yeah? And then you kind of say that this part has that temperature when you make a local measure. Of course, this is only meaningful if there's no interactions in the model whatsoever. Uh, but if the model is interacting, how would you, like, what value of temperature would you assign to the local measurement? That seems not so clear. And the way this kind of locality of temperature question is usually stated is that you think of a kind of a, in an interacting model of a buffer region, and you would say that if the local expectation values in a certain part A would be compatible with the entire state being a Gibbs state at a certain temperature, then you would assign that temperature to, the, to this part and say, this has that temperature. Yeah? But of course, the problem is clear, right? But of course, it seems uh, far from clear like how large that buffer region uh, has to be. It's not even clear like if you make a larger, larger buffer region that the sequence of assigned temperatures would even be convergent. So how large does the buffer region uh, have to be and, and, and kind of is, is that even a finite, a finite sequence? That relates to kind of locality of temperature question in, 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 in this precise way. And again, as we will see, but I will defer that a little bit later. This again relates to a certain clustering of correlations question now for, not for stationary states, but for Gibbs states in a, in a many body. So again, to come back, ground states of gap Lambertonians have clustering correlations. So is there not a Lavillian analog in stationary states, but is there a thermal analog in Gibbs states, in thermal states of many body systems? Also coming back to the original question at the very beginning of the talk. So is there a thermal analog? One could even think that, well, it's of course um, brutally plausible maybe, but I mean, you have, to, you have to show this. One could think that there might be a critical temperature that depend not so much on the model, but only on, and not on the graph, but very crude properties of the graph and the coupling strength maybe, above which you can be sure that all correlations in the model necessarily cluster exponentially. So if you're hot enough, you will get necessarily a clustering of correlations in a thermal quantum many body state. One could think that this is the case. So this is kind of a thermal version of a Lee Robinson bound in a way like a, yeah, like we looked at kind of Lavillian versions of, of, of Lee, Lee Robinson bound. So this is a long-standing open question, or maybe long-standing is a bit of an over exaggeration Of course, there's a kind of long tradition of asking that type of question. Specifically, a lot is known for classical models and for continuum models. And also in one dimension, this is totally hammered down by a beautiful paper by Araki, but much less, fewer insights into quantum lattice <coughs> models. And we look at that <coughs> question in all generality um, building on, on Matt's work, in fact. So one could ask, is there a critical temperature above which you know whatever you have for all covariances, whatever you measure, all correlations necessarily cluster exponentially in, in the lattice? And well, the answer is yes, that's indeed the case. Yeah? So there's a critical temperature, and above that, all correlations would cluster in the lab. So here's the technical version of saying that, but that's just saying the same thing as I said in words. So you have a local Hamiltonian on an arbitrary regular lattice. There's a kind of one size fits all coupling strength, that's um, just, a, just a number. And there exists a critical temperature that not only not depends on the model or on the graph, but only on a certain number, namely the lattice animal constant. And then if you're above that certain critical temperature, you know that all covariances for arbitrary observables would decay exponentially with the distance in the lattice in the same way as say, for a gap Hamiltonian system, correlations would cluster in the lattice. Here for thermal states, if you're above the critical temperature, correlations would decay exponentially in in the lattice. So this is a general statement for arbitrary lattices and arbitrary covariances. Um, again, um, that depends only on very elementary properties of the, of the graph. 
and if you're above the temperature, you know that there's a kind of locality of interaction of correlations or correlation functions would cluster exponentially in the lattice. So what is this lattice animal constant? Well, the lattice animal, that's a connected set of edges. There's clearly a, com a highly combinatorical flavor to that problem. If you look at e to the power of minus beta h, and h is a local Hamiltonian, you get all these Hamiltonian terms. So a, a, a lattice animal is like this. Maybe it looks like an animal. I mean, it's um, up to your, uh, your fantasy. That's an animal, that's another animal. And, uh, well, that's a connected set of edges. And, well, plausibly, the number of <coughs> lattice animals with a certain cardinality grows exponentially with the cardinality of the, of the set. Unsurprisingly, the lattice animal constant is just the, the growth constant of that. So the smallest alpha such that um, AM, the cardinality of like, the number of lattice animals of a certain size, is smaller than alpha to the power of M. This is finite for any regular lattice. Um, for a cubic lattice in D dimensions, I think it's 2 times D times E or so, if D is the dimension of the cubic lattice, and it can be uh, bounded from above. Uh, not for expander graph, but like for regular lattices, this would be a finite number. And this is the only number that enters the argument, so that's the number that fixes the critical temperature above which you know that if you're above the critical temperatures, correlations would cluster in the lattice. So this is a bit of a technical argument, um, but I give kind of a, a, a high level um, flavor of this, uh, kind of given me the, 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 the intuition of this argument, and this is as follows. You have, you look at, well this is the generalized covariance where, where there's a parameter tau in the problem, I will say about this in a second, tau is, say tau is one, okay? That's the standard covariance. Now this is a, obviously a quadratic polynomial in row. So any quadratic polynomial in row can be written using the swap trick as a linear function on two copies of the state. That's kind of the swap trick, sometimes called. Um, any polynomial degree k can be written over k copies of the state. So you use the swap trick, but not once, but several times. That's for reasons to be stated later. So you write the covariance over four copies, row, 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 row on the state, with you, the swap operators where you have f and g being the, the, the local observables. So that's kind of the tensor network picture of the expression that you have if you compute the covariance of, of this table. Now this is an expression over four copies of the state, of the Hilbert space, the four fold copies of the Hilbert space. So you have a Hamiltonian, uh, because these are all Gibbs states, H twiddle that lives on four fold the, the Hilbert space. And this is like a, a, a um, well, a, a Gibbs state, the, the, that's a Gibbs state of a larger Hamilton and a larger set. And on this one, you make you now use of the, the cluster expansion of this new Hamiltonian. So you kind of expand e to the power of minus beta h twiddle. And then you get this combinatorical chainsaw massacre of all the terms appearing when you uh, expand out all these terms of this, of this local Hamiltonian on the fourfold <coughs> copy of, of, of this state. But the trick is the way why this is kind of on this fourfold copy is that that simplifies the combinatorics of the problem significantly and one can prove that if you look at all the clusters that emerge in this combinatorical problem that um, all the clusters that connect only to A but do not touch B or only connect to B but do not touch A they will give exactly zero uh, contribution to the, to the expression. And one can also show that um, uh, that the only paths that contribute are those clusters that combine, that connect, um, connect A and, and, and B. And then one can use um, Matt's truncated cluster expansion that kind of uh, organizes the term that you have by um, uh, the length of the cluster and asking whether you have a, an, an edge of the set F in the, in the combinatorical word and you, make, you finish the combinatorical argument and then you find that um, if you're above a percolation threshold then the long words would be exponentially suppressed and that would give rise to this exponentially uh, uh, clustering expression on the covariance that I mentioned earlier. This is kind of the, the high level argument uh, of, this, of, this, of this proof that you, you formulate as a problem in a high dimensional system using multiple times of the swap trick 
you make it a common rhetorical problem, you look at the different uh, paths that appear and then in the last step apply um, the, the truncated cluster expansion of MAT it discussed in the context of matrix polar operator um, approximations in high temperature states. That's kind of the, the outline uh, of, this, of this proof, but the, the details are, are rather, rather involved. Let me use the, the final minutes of this to give applications of this, um, how this can be used. One use of this is to think of a universal upper bound to phase transition points in thermal many body system. It's not only universal, but in a way it's kind of super universal because it does not only depend on the, on the Hamiltonian or the universality class or so, but it does not only not depend on the Hamiltonian and not on the graph, but only on the lattice animal constant of the graph. So it's kind of a, a super crude, super universal upper bound to any phase transition point that you can have in a thermal state of a quantum many body system. That's a kind of a nice, useful, that's kind of the, the complement of the interesting region, so to say. So that's kind of the, the, reason, the, the region where there can be no thermal phase transition anymore. And if we look at that, for example, for the ferromagnetic 2D isotropic easing model that Matt mentioned also in his talk without external field, you find that this crude one size fits all upper bound would be, uh, well, give it the value 24.58, whatever, that comes out of this, this expression. Whereas the actual phase transition is known to happen at 2.27. Yeah? Well, this is not brutally tight, but one should not, um, well, yeah, should not forget that it does not even not depend on the model or not on the Hamiltonian, not on the graph, but only on the lattice animal constant of the graph. And then it's not so bad that you're kind of, well, the order of magnitude off to really show where any phase transition point can happen in that kind of model. Um, to kind of bound the, the, the region where the, the, the phase transition physics can possibly happen. So that's kind of one application of this to find a, a bound to Curie temperatures of interactive models in many body systems at thermal states. The second is the length scale of temperature problem that I anticipated at the very beginning. This can be made precise as follows that you, okay, you have a many body Hamiltonian, you look at a region A, and you look at the buffer region around that. That links to the question, discussion that they had over lunch uh, yesterday. Yeah? So you have these, this kind of finite term. And this part here is just the, the connecting parts that connect this buffer region to the rest of the lattice. That's HI. And the error you make in the expectation values on the full Gibbs state of the many body system compared to the Gibbs state, and if you only look at the, the buffer region, would be exactly given by this quantity here. This is an equality, not an inequality, where you find a covariance over this, well, generalized covariance, that's where the parameter tau comes in, over um, this interaction Hamiltonian for this family that just uh, ramps in that interaction from having no interaction and having the full many body Hamiltonian. Yeah? So you can relate the kind of locality of temperature problem and the truncation problem to a question of covariances in the many body model. And if you, <coughs> that would be actually interesting to see whether this can be applied also to the, to the ground set context. But if you apply that here, you really find that if you use that result on the covariances mentioned earlier, you really find this locality of temperature uh, problem that there's a length scale that's exactly given by the length scale of the previous theorem. And on that length scale, temperature is defined. You just, that defines the buffer region. If you have that, then that's the region at which you can meaningfully speak of a temperature. That's kind of the thermal length scale. And that can also be used in rigorous approaches to quantum thermodynamics and canonical typicality of the type of question that Matt's conference in Aspen last week uh, was um, actually addressed. So that can be used to get t t uh, length scales of temperature in the high temperature limit. Obviously, it also relates to stability of high temperature thermal states. If you have a here, if you make a Hamiltonian perturbation there, then you will not feel it very much. So all this gives rise to a stability theorem for high temperature thermal states of many body systems in, in pretty much all generality that one can dream of, except in the high temperature limit. It also means, as an immediate corollary, that one can compute local expectation values of high temperature many body Hamiltonians in, like in P, in, in, uh, in polynomial time, 
Well, trivially, now, because you just, you know what error you make, you cut out your piece and you compute expectation values. So high temperature expectation values of local observables R in P can be efficiently computed for an arbitrary lattice, for an arbitrary Hamiltonian. In this sense, this is an efficiently solvable problem. It also gives rise to a guideline for quantum Monte Carlo. If you sample out a system at any temperature, you know what kind of finite size system you need in order to faithfully sample the, the Monte Carlo problem for a given error. So it also gives a guideline to, to Monte Carlo sampling problems in, in, in Gibbs states of, of many body systems. Um, so this carry goes uh, mostly to Matt. So one finds also a matrix product state approximation, which is efficient in 1D. So that's the mixed state version of a matrix product, say, to, well, to, to mixed states. In, 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 uh, for an arbitrary lattice, this is not efficient, but it still gives rise to a sub-exponential uh, the bond dimension of the many-body um, system. And finally, all this also works for fermions, for interacting fermions, like for the Hubbard model. One can go through the entire proof, and one would not, as, 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 as like Aram and, and, and uh, we discussed on like having long range strings or so, this does not appear. So the entire proof also works for local fermions of the lattice. <laughs> and again, you find all the theorems can be also written out for interacting fermions with the same co constraints on locality and so on. And that generalizes early results on like covariance matrices of interacting fermionic models that Matt has also looked at some time ago. I think 45 minutes, I'm up. So, Lessons, we look at the question of a length scale at which one can speak of a temperature. We found that kind of the low energy physics might be complicated, but high temperature states have always clustering of correlations. And that's a very crude property of the model, only a kind of the lattice animal concept entering. If you're above the critical temperature, all correlation functions necessarily cluster exponentially in the lattice, so this is kind of the, 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 the easiest uh, setting uh, of, a, of a many body model. And specifically, that means that one can efficiently compute local expectation values of arbitrary local observables, of arbitrary lattice models, and arbitrary lattices in the high temperature limit. So, in this sense, uh, high temperature states are easier. One can compute local expectation values of arbitrary local observables in arbitrary local Hamiltonian uh, 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 problems. Which brings me to the end of the talk. We looked at kind of Hamiltonian complexity inspired questions, but on <coughs> open and thermal many body systems. We first looked at the question of Louvillians and kind of notions of Louvillian complexity that's on the one hand inspired by kind of more practical or engineering type questions whether one can use of dissipation to prepare states make dissipative quantum memories to think of <coughs> dissipative controlled many body dynamics in the lab. It's an interesting arena to study many body problems, but on the other hand also to kind of complete this program of relating time mixing to spatial mixing. That's a complete program in the classical world to push that to the quantum world and then look at kind of mixing times versus spatial correlations in the, in the quantum many body setting. We found that there's a clustering of correlations if one has a Louvillian gap. There's an area law if one has this more stringent notion of a finite log Sobolev concept as a tighter concept of mixing. And we found this kind of crime story of, well, preparing to a biological order that's perfectly possible with dissipative dynamics, but there's this kind of tension between having topological order and stability in this many body problems. It seems to be an exciting open problem to, to look at and, 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 and an important question to, to be resolved to think of dissipative topologically protected quantum memories in, in, in low dimension. And finally, we looked at the temperature problem and found that temperature is intensive for high temperatures and correlations in thermal many body states are finite. We're going to get the cluster of correlations above a certain critical point for arbitrary lattices, arbitrary Hamiltonians, and so on. That critical temperature only depends on the lattice animal constant. If you are above that, everybody is dead. And all kind of phase transitions are below. And that brings me back to the question of the beginning of this workshop. Look, does the exponential complexity of general quantum systems persist at high temperatures? And the answer is no. Thank you.
questions? Yes. So it's a little bit of an naive question, but uh, can you give me some sort of feel for what log sublet does that the gap doesn't do? And some I sort of have a feeling of the gap in terms of driving down the eigenvectors, but I don't. I I guess I don't know enough about log sublet to see why it's giving me a little extra. Um. Yeah, well, like, um, well, it's a tighter, more stringent bound to, to mixing, like a hand wavy way is, say, if you look at, um, like, the relative entropy distance of a time evolved state of an open system to the stationary state, you let that evolve in time, you plug in the Lavillian, and you express the derivative of this relative entropy type expression in terms of relative entropy, then you get kind of tighter entropy based bounds, not in terms of the, 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 the one norm, but relative entropy based bounds. And those bounds give rise to these more stringent uh, uh, types of faster mixing in terms of that log of concept. That's kind of the, the hand wavy way, it's kind of a more of an entropic type of mixing than a, a spectral type of mixing. That's kind of the intuition that you have here. So this is kind of a quantum version of this more stringent, like entropic type uh, mixing of a many wave system. That's kind of the, the hand wavy way. Yes. What do you mean by general quantum system? Oh, that was I didn't write that. That was in the on the web page of the the workshop. What What do you mean? Since you're answering the question. Oh, um, okay. Um, I mean a local many body Hamiltonian <coughs> on a regular graph. So this sense. So if this setting of lattices. Setting of lattices. lattices. Okay. Right. In this sense, well, that's a kind of. Uh, among these questions. I, I, I would delete general then. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. I mean, I put it there because I, that was Matt's question, I guess, or your question. Yeah. yeah. Maybe just yep. you accepted expander graphs uh, from the discussion. You said they're not, but. A bounded degree expander graph would have a bounded exponent for lattice animals. So, what's the distinction you're drawing? Oh, uh, no, I don't, I don't make any distinction. I just mean whenever there's a finite lattice animal constant, then oh, you can derive these results. I'm just saying that I know for any regular graph, the bounded uh, the lattice animal constant would be bounded. I just uh, I had thought yeah. you accepted expander graphs and said they wouldn't work on. I would not. I mean, the the lattice animal constant is surely not bounded on an expander graph. But I mean, it can't be larger than the degree of the. Yeah. Oh, then it's also fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, whenever that's finite, then that's okay. that's finite. Okay. But I mean, that's the theorem. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure of whether. Does anybody know, Matt? Maybe. Like, is there graphs? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can, often you can just compute them. As I said, for a cubic lattice, you really get exactly two times d times. Mm -hmm. So th these numbers are known. It doesn't tie books on, on, on lattice elements. It'll be easier to okay. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Other questions? No, thanks again. Okay, thanks.